Um, these are two recent collapses. Uh, these are public domain photographs. I worked on both of these. Uh, one of them is a residential tenanted building that we had a collapse during uh, uh, collateral damage from uh, adjacent construction. Uh, complicated situation, but the building was kind of decayed and we had this very dramatic trauma. And fortunately, that's the building on the right. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. The building on the on the left was this kind of a spontaneous um, collapse of a of a commercial building. It used to have residential tenants as illness, but it's on a busy thoroughfare in one of our boroughs, and there was no pre-warning or very little pre-warning. So what you don't want is your building to end up like these. Uh, why? Because it's very disruptive. And besides the fact you could end up seriously impacting somebody's health or worse, um, it's very disruptive to operations, to your organization, to your client, to a development. It's a big mess and it's a mess for the, uh, for the department to sort out afterwards. Okay, so we're going to move on. So this is kind of what we're trying to avoid. So we don't want your buildings to end up like these singular events. And the first thing you need to know is there is really families of buildings to look at. In our 1.1 million buildings, about 860,000 are occupied. The other 150 are really unoccupied buildings. 150,000 are unoccupied. They're garages and second buildings and auxiliary buildings. The building department records every building in the city. So if you give every building a bin number, building identification number, you end up assigning a bin number to, play, to structures like single story garages, um, warehouses, uh, family dwellings, residential buildings, apartment buildings. But really, if you look at them, there are really uh, 860,000 are occupiable and the other 150,000 are really ancillary buildings, but they exist and we record data on them. Um, so we are, we're inclined to like to put these things into, into families of buildings. And the largest family is really the residential um, family of buildings. Tenement buildings, which are really apartment buildings, and it doesn't matter that the term tenement sort of implies sort of lower income. That's not the case. We're really talking about all buildings with rental units, regulated units, and there's about 300,000 of those in the city. One and two family dwellings, which are private dwellings, one and two families, where owners are living in them, there are 520,000 of those. So between the two packages of tenement rental buildings and private dwellings, one and two families, you're really up to about 860,000 buildings right off the bat. Then you add in some pure commercial buildings. Everybody thinks that commercial buildings, there's a lot more in the city than there actually is, but a pure commercial building where there's no tenants in it, the numbers are really quite small. Uh, finding that a, a, a precise number is a little difficult. We use it. We use multiple databases to find it, but the real number is knocking around 10,000, somewhere like that. Pure commercial buildings with no tenement, no residential units. Residential units changes the whole complexion of a building and the risk assigned to it. Because as soon as you have somebody living inside a unit at night, the risk is significantly greater. They're not ambulatory at night. You can have old people, infants like that inside a residential building. That may not be, you know, that that in a commercial building, you have more transient conditions. Nobody's staying overnight. You don't have anybody really living in there. And a commercial building is significantly less risky to us because it's, it's more transient usage during the day. Uh, nobody's staying there at night. The other issue is there are really quite high ranking laws um, that regulate tenement buildings. And, uh, and that's really their state laws. They actually outrank us. And that's useful because um, residential state laws, really, it's a very high ranking law. And you get residential re uh, regulated tenant groups in there. So the buildings are very difficult to move residential buildings. And you've got regulated tenant groups, which means that it's very difficult to move the buildings out of our population very difficult to restore them because they're full of residents and it's difficult to demolish them because they got resident uh, re, um, regulated units publicly owned buildings again they're relatively well maintained they're easy to track down uh, they're better maintained they generally don't have residential units in them 
uh, publicly owned buildings, a good population of buildings to, uh, to track because they become essential facilities in the event of a major uh, hurricane or earthquake like this. These publicly owned buildings are frequently used to house uh, people in states of emergencies. They're good to know. And the others are houses of worship, retaining walls. These odd type structures, Penn Station would be one, for example, another type structure. Um, sort of people think of these things as mixed use, houses of worship, they're really others where they don't really fit into publicly owned commercial or, or residential buildings. Okay, so that is really the families of buildings. And I want to sort of get your head into thinking, well, having a building fall down or get messed up during construction, is really bad for families. And uh, so when you think of sort of populations of buildings, it's kind of good to keep that term families of buildings inside your head as well. Okay, um, looking at data by the numbers, and this is something that I've, I've had trouble to myself with having spent uh, a decade and a half data mining existing buildings. When you've got a million and uh, just over a million existing buildings, it's very hard to track data that was not recorded in the digital domain in one location. DOB generally does not track data construction. And data construction is important because a lot of uh, engineers and contractors sort of get a first bead on the welfare of the status of a building based on when it was built. It's not always true, but it can be true. If you date the building, you can determine whether it's a risky building or not. So one thing is, is we're always looking for record data. Record data is more important to us than private data, small number private data. So we look at small numbers of private data, but what we're really looking for is record data in the open domain, um, in the open, in New York City open domain uh, domain for um, for these big data sets. Our collapse is singular. We, we, we draw a lot of conclusions based on partial collapses, events at buildings, gas explosions, um, you, you know, and unintended, uh, unintended consequences of construction collateral lot line building causing partial collapses. Are they singular? Is it a singular event where you can't, you can't really draw and extrapolate it to other types of similar buildings? Well, we've explored that. Uh, our collapse is predictive. Problem with collapses is they're very dramatic, but they are very small numbers. So when you look at data for them, you will actually find quite a lot of information on, on collapses, but it's not easy to extrapolate that data into a broad uh, population of buildings. Can you get stuff data that's predictive? We've actually found a way of finding that there's quite good predictions in this universe. Can you extract building performance from data? Can you determine if a building is, pre is precipitously close to having a structural event based on its age of construction, based on its occupancy, based on prescriptive codes? Well, we've actually correlated a lot of that data and we begin to see trends in there too. Can you get data into small enough um, data sets where you're not thinking, oh, I've got a half a million buildings that I have to analyze. Half a million buildings is just, it's a huge data point. If we're trying to even get out to inspect data, inspect buildings, if we have a, a data set of 500 buildings, even for us who has a large number of inspectors, we have 600 inspectors, doing special data, you know, special inspection runs of six and 700 buildings is a formidable task. Six and 700 buildings is not a large number of buildings, but it's a lot to try and get out in front of. Just keep an eye out, are we going to have a structural event of one of these buildings? Are instances of maintenance problems predictive? Can we determine whether a building hasn't been maintained? Is there public domain data that tells us some of this stuff? And we found that there is. Uh, it's, it's not quite where we thought we would find it, but we've actually found a lot of maintenance that's in the public domain on buildings. And we're going to show you where that information is. Are unsafe conditions dense in some typologies? Unsafe conditions density means that if you can typecast failures and maintenance issues into, into some building um, groups, you can actually figure out whether there's density of conditions, whether you have, have the same recurring problems in a subgroup. And getting subgroups makes it much easier for all of us to get our, he our heads around um, do we have a, is it a random occurrence that we're going to, you're going to have a problem with a building? That's useful to know because owners don't know whether their buildings are, what do they know? They don't know anything. They, they're collecting rent 
uh, you know, they're maintaining the inside of the building. They don't realize that there is a, a latent condition developing in their property. And worse, the problem is there could be a latent condition with an adjacent building where there's a developer next door to this. And then they end up taking on some underpinning job that causes all types of mess on the, on, on the construction site. So we've liked, we sort of like this RCPO, residential, commercial, publicly owned and, and others classification. We've been using it for a while. It seems to be pretty good for us uh, to try and get you. It's actually a very old methodology of classifying buildings. It really goes back to the 19th century. And it, it sort of gets sets of buildings into packages, which makes it a little bit easier for us to get our head around this stuff. Is, there, is it predictive? We found that it's beginning to become quite predictive, this, unit, um, this, this universe. Vernacular terms in construction. All agencies seem to have their own vernacular terms. Fire has vernacular terms. Building department has vernacular terms. Um, is there a data dictionary for some of, for some of this, for this, uh, these populations of buildings? Well, what we've actually found is there is some data dictionaries for these, these construction typologies, but it kind of wasn't where we thought we'd find it. We found a lot of it in the state's requirement for the, um, for the uh, multiple dwelling universe and for the rented dwellings. These were very high ranking definitions for, for occupancy. And what it did is it set in motion the way buildings are defined for occupancy. And usually once you get a, a definition for occupancy, you start getting prescriptive requirements for how the buildings were put together. Once you get prescriptive requirements, you are, you're, in, you're in a much easier universe to try and get your head around what, what to deal with, whether you've got one of these risky buildings on your lot line. And then once you start getting defined terms, you can start merging it with other data for, for precision. Okay, <clears throat> open data by the numbers, predicting structural decay of existing buildings by the numbers. What we did is we went to the open data record database that's in, it's in New York City, uh, it's, in, it's in our open data uh, for DOB for complaints. Now, complaints go back to 1989. It was the first system that the DOB, the first digitized system for, for recording information on buildings. And the advantage of it is it's extremely consistent. It goes back to 1989. And if you actually look at the data sets, you can download them. There's two and a half million records in there for complaints. Once you have records, you can start merging them with building addresses, typologies, types of construction, material science. And it became very robust data to try and get a history of buildings with complaints. So we decided to go to the two and a half million building complaints that is in DOB's data, it's in open data. And it was nice because there was 100 choices way back when. Now we've added and removed choices, like we have boiler complaints. We've got elevator complaints, and these guys all get special complaint numbers. But the very first complaint number is really for a serious event. Somebody getting injured or there's a fatality is called a zero one. And it's defined in our complaints screen as an accident. And it includes, the complaints is also useful because it includes permitted work, everything that's under construction, which does get a lot of complaints, but you can separate them out. And then existing buildings are also beneficial. Existing buildings, there's a lot of data on existing buildings. You just need to know the complaint codes in here. And you can parse that two and a half million complaints almost down the min middle. One and a quarter million complaints in existing buildings, one and a quarter million complaints in permitted work. Permitted work, you can dump it. You can put it to the side. What we're really looking for is existing buildings. You got 100 complaint categories. Well, we didn't find that there was 100 in complaint categories for structural issues. We found that there was about four. It was category one, 10, 30, and 73. We didn't put 10 up here, but it turned out that you can use one, 30, 10, and 73, which were really failure to maintain in existing buildings. Now that made it much easier to scrub our complaint screen, which is open data records, to see where the trouble was in existing buildings. Um, and we got rid of boilers, we got rid of mechanical, uh, mechanical electrical plumbing, occupancy, all of those sort of low line ones that are very targeted. And we got rid of permitted work. We got that two and a half million down to 200,000 complaints. Now the 200,000 complaints is very strange because what we found is if you have a 200,000 complaints, 
for every building that got a failure to maintain for something structural, it had a second complaint nearly consistently. So every building that had a failure to maintain bits falling off, its floors falling, building collapses, had more than one of the same complaints. So then what we said is, well, we're not really dealing with 200,000, we're dealing with 100,000 complaints. 100,000 complaints was a much easier number to handle. So then we, we, were, we got that two and a half million down to 100,000. So we said, okay, let's see where these records of all of these 100,000s are in the existing building universe. Are they throughout 1.1 million buildings? Are they dense in certain populations? You'd expect them to be dense in 19th century unreinforced masonry buildings, and they were, but they're very dense inside one subpopulation. So we found that 60,000 of this 100,000 complaints were in regulated rent, regulated tenement housing that was in HBD's universe. And it made sense to us because these are very, they're the first generation of rental buildings that the city had to offer. And they were state regulated. The state actually put regulations in place for rental buildings with tenanted groups way back in the 1850s. And those buildings have been heavily populated and not generally really well maintained. And there's reasons for this. One, they're, they're extremely old. Two, they're loaded with tenant groups. So it's very hard to move the tenant groups. And two, you generally have an absentee landlord where the landlord is not in residence. Okay. You also have large numbers of one and two family dwellings. But one and two family dwellings that had renters in them, we did not get a lot of complaints. Why? Because there was a lot of rent groups in there that just generally did not call in complaints because there were some problems with the rental, you know, the, way, the ways that rentals were set up in those one and two family houses. So we didn't see a lot of complaints in there, but when we did have rent uh, problems in one and two family dwellings, they were serious. They were ferocious. They were fires. They were, um, you know, illegal occupancy issues with gas explosions, all types of nonsense like that in one and two family dwellings and not heavily regulated. So we found 60,000 in state regulated old law tenements, new law tenements um, converted dwellings and 40,000 across the rest of 1.1 million uh, buildings. So that was very useful. So 60,000 complaints for structural problems turned up in one relatively small population of buildings. Now, what's the advantage of this is because if you know you got one of them as a client or you're dealing with one of them because you got one on your lot line, you can now identify you got to start paying attention to these things because the density of complaints tells us that there is historic problems with these buildings. It's not anecdotal and it's not opinion based and the data is not coming out of private databases. And it's not somebody's opinion about whether this thing is risky or not risky. The numbers support the fact that you need to be vigilant looking at some of these residential occupied tenement buildings. And they turn up inside and they're in the older parts of New York City, which means they end up inside areas that are very favorable for redevelopment. They've got good zoning, so they make good candidates for recycling because you get favorable FAR in these prop properties and you get favorable uh, floor area ratio and you're in dense areas where we need to get a lot of housing in areas. And, and that's why these things become, they, they become in neighborhoods that we would expect to find them. Not in the outer boroughs, in outer Queens where you have single family homes, but in the downtown areas of Manhattan, Queens and Brooklyn and the Bronx. So, we looked at a couple of the, I just gave you a sample of our complaint categories. For every database that we data mined, I'm going to give you a copy of it at the end of the, at, at the end of this presentation. The advantage of getting the, 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 um, the links to the open data is that you can get other data there and the information is free. All you have to do is download it. And I trust this open data because the data sets are huge. Okay, so I've identified the ones that I like to use here for existing buildings. Uh, can accident construction plum plumbing, very old, goes back to 89, and that's a good one. So we've been checking that one. Building shaking and vibration, that's a great one for us. That turns up a lot in existing buildings. Failure to maintain, I love that one. It turns up all over the place in existing buildings. So these are the ones we kind of like to look at for structural complaints. Okay, that's just a sample. And it's, it gets to a point now where you can start predicting the decay of buildings 
based on density of the density of complaints. So if you've got a building that you're studying or a building that's in your client uh, portfolio or that's in your office and it's an existing building, where's, what's the first thing I do? I look at the complaint screen and see what's in there because it's in it's in DOB's biz and there's all types of stuff regarding the failure to maintain. If you've got open five, five open failure to maintain, you've got an owner that's not maintaining the buildings. Then you can check to see if anything's in there for for um for repairs. If there's nothing being repaired, you can see it in the complaints and in the filing screen. It's free, and we check it when we go to a job. So expect the DOB to check it. If you get one of these jobs where you have an existing building, the first question out of our mouth is, have you checked its the date open data? to see if there's any complaints for failure to maintain on that building. Was there a history of complaints? Because a lot of collapses that we have usually have a history of failure to maintain and comparable events. In other words, the building has been decaying and people have been calling in the decay to a point where the building collapsed. But usually you'll find that there's a series of complaints on this stuff that give you an indication that you can expect comparable trouble with the decaying in the building. Very useful, and we use it all the time. So residential tenement housing complaint screen. So this is where we found that this stuff is dense. Okay, we found it in old law tenements. Old law tenements is a state-defined term. It's not vernacular. It's an open data state-defined term, and it de defines the building physics, occupancy, egress, data construction. A lot of this stuff is free when you say old law tenements, and they're pre-1901. In fact, old law tenements can be frequently found in New York City going back to 1850, frequently. So you get an old law tenement, you find it on HPD's database, you can tell a number of things about it. One, it's pre-1901. Two, there's a regulated date on it, and it, it, it has a prescriptive construction. And now I'm going to tell you basically what we have found inside those populations. We have found in old law tenement that we do get collapses. Now, fortunately, it doesn't lead to fatalities, but there's a lot of disruption and we get them. We get collapses in that population. Do we get collapses in commercial buildings that are unreinforced masonry on occasion? Do we get collapses in publicly owned buildings? Very rarely. Do we get collapses in others' houses of worship? They're rare, but you do find them in old law tenements. And why are they risky? Because they are tenements and they're they are loaded full of residential units. So there's 28,000 of these things left in the city. They are registered every year. And we found there's 20,000 failure to maintain complaints in them. Now they've been repaired by ownership, but you can tell a lot, they have to be repaired. These things are ferocious age. They're highly populated with tenant groups. The landlords are out, you get decaying in them just regular decay of the structure. And there is a couple of things that are deal breakers in these buildings, not material science, but structural stability for uh, stability, which is slenderness ratio and buckled wall. These things are very hard to overcome. Okay, 20,000 complaints in 28,000 buildings, it's nearly a one-to-one -one ratio. But actually you gotta remember that we discounted half of every complaint. So there's really 40,000 complaints in there. So for every building, you're gonna have two complaints. Now they do get repaired, but there is a history. If there's a history, it means that you can predict performance based on them. You get demolitions, you get shoring, you get vacates, you get regulated tenant groups, pieces falling off, loads of pieces fall off these buildings. Collateral damage, loads of it. Collateral damage, why do we get collateral damage? Because the development rights inside urban areas where you have downtown areas is favorable for large FAR, which means you can get a lot of floor area in a downtown development area and a redevelopment for zoning. But the problem is that it's loaded with these older tenement buildings. And we can't move the tenement groups. Why? They're state regulated, doesn't belong to us. And there's also regulated tenement groups in there for uh, rent controlled, rent stabilized. And those groups, it's not negotiable. You've got to keep them in their residence, or you gotta make sure that you look after them when the buildings have been repaired. Converted dwellings. One and two family dwellings built in, in New York between 1840 and 1920. Uh, they, they made great single family houses. 
but they didn't make sing great single house family houses indefinitely, but they made great apartment buildings for four or five families. And the building was already built and you could put a family on each floor. They were a great candidates for multiple dwellings. So one or two family row houses became very sought after to do a development. One, generally the owners had the asset already and the mortgage was paid off. So they could get a construction loan to do a horizontal and vertical enlargement and then turn it into a rental dwelling and move out. And then the owners moved out. They rarely stayed in the building. So they converted their one and two family dwelling that they lived in to a rented building. It was a very easy development to do. Love it. Uh, so those converted dwellings, they're all before 1901. There's 20,000 of those in the city with 8,000 complaints. It's actually not 8,000 complaints. It's 16,000 complaints. Do we get collapses in those? We do. Do we get demolitions? Sure. Great candidates for demolitions. Regulated tenant group means you can't demolish them. Shoring for sure. Vacates. Difficult to do a vacate of a dwelling unit where you've got renters in there. Or you've got co-ops and condos where these things have been converted to co-ops and condos. Pieces falling off, you bet. We have pieces falling. Cornices fall off. Brownstone falls off. Uh, bricks fall off. Very common in this universe. Collateral damage, yes, because developments adjacent to these buildings are numerous. Uh, two and a half buildings to one complaint. When you think of it, it's actually 16,000. It's nearly one to one. So good candidates for a problem. I would say yes. One and two family dwellings. Okay, HPD has a record of these things that were rented but are not rented now. And these things are tricky because there are one or two family dwellings out there that are in HPD's database where the landlord is not living in them. They're actually rented dwellings but are not registered where the landlord is out. And frequently you get illegal occupancy in those buildings. And if you have illegal occupancy, I'm not saying that's the case all the time, but you do have illegal occupancy in these things. And if anybody's living in an illegally occupied apartment, they're not inclined to call in complaints. So you can have problems, structural problems, and then it's blind to you because there's nothing on the complaint screen. But you have to be vigilant to that. Do we get collapses in there? Yes, but actually more, more often we have these ferocious fires in there where you know a building that was designed to have two families in it has four or five families in it. And you get this, uh, this bad electrical fire or CO2 issue where a boiler gives a problem and you get these very nasty occurrences in these buildings. Demolitions, yes. Shoring, yes. Vacates, yes. Pieces falling off, yes. Collateral damage, yes. The problem with collateral damage is, again, they're in the downtown areas. Why? Because they're pre-1901, which means they're in the dense areas of the city. New law tenements, they're a defined building classification. They were between 1901 and 1929. You get any of these defined terms, you can date them. Not only can you date them, you, you have a prescriptive specification for how they were built. Very useful. Okay, you do get choring. We don't get too many collapses of new law tenements because they're bigger buildings. This is sort of progressive issues where a building started off as a one or two family, then it was converted to a multiple dwelling, and then it was enlarged or rebuilt to become a new law tenement. Okay. And this is, these are defined terms. You may not know they exist, but they exist and they are larger than life. And they are state regulated, which means they outrank us. And they're defined terms. And does anybody have data on this stuff? Yes, I do. And I showed it with you and I'll share it with you now. Is there a high probability of having a problem with one of these buildings as an extent building where you're working for an owner? Yes. Can they be repaired easily? Can they be collaterally damaged? Absolutely. Can you have a collapse sneak up on you? For sure. Do you know where they are? Absolutely. Now we're not dealing with a million buildings. We are really down to a defined population of 90,000 buildings. So nearly all of our collapses, all of our complain complaints, and all of our failure to maintain are in these denser buildings, okay? Which is useful to know. I'm not targeting this stuff. This is where the data is. And it kind of makes a lot of sense to people. It's just you don't know it. The older buildings, the 1850s, unreinforced masonry building. Well, if you actually look at what the building is, you bet you it's going to turn out to be in a multiple dwelling, not actually regulated by HPD. So we have all lot tenements, 28,000. 
new lot tenements, 41,000. Heretofore converted, 20,000. And a few one and two family rented dwellings, 100 grand. We're down to 10% of our total population, sucking up all of our capacity in failure to maintain complaints, repairs, and adventures for construction. Nice to know. So here's the consequences of what, what happens with these buildings. If they get sort of go sideways relative to structural stability. If you have an existing building where your client is the owner and you're repairing it or you need to do an assessment of it, or the landlord needs to keep an eye on what's going on there, it's an administrative code provi provi provision that they have to maintain them safe. Very broad term safe. What does that mean? It's an administrative code provision. You have to maintain them safe. safe. If one of these things goes sideways and we have a structural problem, we have injuries or worse. We can have fatalities. We haven't had one in an existing building, but it is, it is, it, it is a candidate. So don't overlook it. Injuries, it's possible. We've had injuries in these things. The local law universe over seven stories, you have bits falling off. Bits falling off are problematic because they can be, cause fatalities without the building falling down. We've had that. You'll have a, a headache with the enforcement strategy on that. Enforcement is a big issue if you have an injury or an accident with one of these buildings. Vacate the families. It's significant enforcement because it's a state regulated issue to deal with the tenant groups. And it's cumbersome to find places for these guys if you have to move them out in a heartbeat. Rentals versus co-ops and condos. Watch out for the difference between a rental building that you're dealing with and a co-op and condos. Co-op and condos, multiple owners in one building. A rental, multiple dwelling where, where the building is actually singly owned. The renter's not going to be there. The, the renters are going to be in, in, in residence. The landlord is going to be an absentee landlord and highly likely nowhere near the building. So you have an obligation to relocate families. It's a big issue. Shoring stability is an issue. If you have a shoring job, it's very complicated. It's expensive and it requires a lot of engineering. A shoring job. Repairing it is not so complicated because you can do it in kind. But if you have a shoring and stability issue, it's complex and it's expensive and you have to move everybody else out. Repairs are not complicated. Why? Because these buildings are prescriptive and you can do like with like repairs and it's very effective. The only snag with a like with like repair, it's expensive. Okay, and I'll tell you why it's expensive in a minute. Because the asset value of the building relative to the amount of units in it is, is the, the asset value is low, the expense of the repairs is high. You get a condo building with 100 units in it, the repairs, a million dollars repairs divided over 100 people. If you have a rental unit building with four or five units or 10 units and you still have a million dollar repairs, it's one landlord picking up the entire and you don't end up with an improved building. All you're doing is restoring a building that's already in its standing. So it's kind of an odd thing. You put a lot of money into it. You get no improvements, no extra units. Sales refinancing insurance issues. Usually landlords do not front end repair money for this stuff. What they say is, I have a structurally unsafe building, go, I have to go to my insurance company. And then you find that there's a whole load of work or hurt with the insurance companies. We have a lot. And then the city has to step in to do some repairs or dem demolitions, it's, it's expensive. Okay, and it's very disruptive dealing with one of these. It, it, it sucks up all your capacity because of the occupancy issue. Basically an empty building with very little public safety um, safety issues like a building collapsing on the sidewalk. You can deal with that. You could cordon it off. You can do mechanical demolition. But if you, even if you have an empty building that's on the public way, it's a public safety issue. Even if there's no tenants, it's disruptive. Okay. So then you have the other side of this whole universe, which is you've got one of these existing buildings next to a development. So either you're on the development side or you're on the existing building side. Existing buildings, we've just enumerated some of the issues. A developer, you've got all of the existing building issues and then you got some. You got to deal with the, pop, the possibility of making a building that was tenuously stable and badly assessed. You have a structural stability issue where you lose a, part, uh, a party wall. You could have injuries to the construction workers. That's pretty common with underpinning. Not so common now as it used to be, but we've had it. And that is a huge issue with enforcement. You could be into civil, 
uh, you could be into criminal prosecutions and that it's, it's cumbersome. Vacates the families, you cause collateral damage to an adjacent building. That was something the building department was not tracking as well as it should have been, but I can assure you we are tracking it now. You've uh, a vacate of a collaterally damaged adjacent building, everybody's in, everybody's in it. There'll be no, oh, I didn't get my insurance money, I didn't repair it, the owner didn't tell me to do the work, I never reported it correctly, none of that, that's all done. Uh, so we've got different standards of, standards for uh, what, what happened with the adjacent buildings. Obligation to relocate families, that's a big burden for developers. Uh, we have one developer right now is putting up a building, a uh, tenant group in a building in a hotel, and they've been in there for eight weeks. They don't want to be in there, they'd rather be in their own apartments. Uh, but they're being put up in a hotel with uh, meals provided by the hotel three times a day. Uh, three times a day. Um, obligation to relocate, rental versus co-op and condos. Dealing with a rental building is one thing, but dealing with a co-op or condo on the, on the lot line, you could be dealing with six individual parties where you have to deal with six individual parties, very difficult. Stop work orders, they're a must. A stop work order will go on a, on a developed site if you collaterally damage an adjacent building. And that puts the project at risk and nobody wants that. Building department doesn't want it and we don't want you to get into a bind with this issue. Workers and families are out of work. So everybody who's getting a paycheck on the construction site is out of a job. You gotta find other work for them. Most of the time they just get laid off. And that's bad for this environment as well. So we wanna try and avoid that. Okay, and here's the two big ones. You have failure to safeguard. You know, they're curable. A failure to safeguard violation is curable. You mess it up, you can cure it under site safety, or you have a construction error, you can do an attribution for construction error. You can cure them as a developer relatively quickly. If you have a design error on a development site and it's impacted the collaterally damaged building next door, there are very, very long cure times because we've got engineering units that have to audit the drawings. And then when it takes us a bit of time to audit the drawings, but we're gonna get there in the end and we're gonna write tickets. Basically the tickets are something we already know is wrong in the drawings. They're extremely difficult to cure. Now that's not our intention, but that's what you get. You get an engineering audit. Hopefully the engineering audit does not prove a design mistake or an observation mistake. They're hard to cure. Why? Because it takes time to get the engineering audit and then it, it takes time for you to figure out if there was some, something overlooked. Design errors are difficult to get around and they're slow. And they're very, this, this problem with collateral damage is very disruptive to parties. Okay, pre-1901 existing residential buildings. We're down to a population of 90,000 that we think are worth looking at. We're not thinking anymore. We know that this is where our problems lie, okay? And we can't take them on. The building department, we do many buildings and we can't proactively go out and look at all of these buildings. There is an obligation to owners to maintain them safe and develops to make sure that you don't mess them up. But what we've done is we've given you primers to determine whether you have an issue or not and how best to tackle them. Okay, pre-1929 multiple dwellings, old lot tenements, new lot tenements converted. It's only 10% of the population of houses in New York. 10%, it's not a lot. We got it down to 90,000 buildings now, but it has 60% of all of our problems and 90% of our collapses. So you, if you've got one of these things, you've got to pay attention to it. You can't be guessing just because it's an unreinforced masonry building. Unreinforced masonry buildings go across 1.1 million buildings, but not all 1.1 uh, million unreinforced masonry buildings are problematic. But these ones can be problematic and the numbers support paying attention to them. And it's 90,000. Commercial buildings, a lot of them have been small to commercial buildings. They've already been converted in the last 15, 20 years. Pure commercial buildings, they're few and far between. Publicly owned buildings, unreinforced masonry buildings, there's thousands of them, but they're relatively well maintained. Others, houses of worship, retaining walls, they're a little tricky, but they're rare. So you're definitely down into residential uh, dwelling units. Okay, they're prescriptively built following 19th century codes. The great thing about 19th century codes is they're prescriptive. You do not have to get your calculator out. You use the codes, to figure out what the specifications were for the buildings. They're all the same. These 90,000 buildings, they all followed the same patterns. Okay, and they're families of buildings. There's only a few types. They're nearly all brick bearing walls and wood framed. 
and it's a kit of parts. In-kind repairs are very effective on this thing. And that's why preservation architects and engineers do so well. Why? Because they don't re-engineer most of the time. They, what they do is they take out what was rotten and what's messed up and they put back, uh, they prescriptively design and repair the building in kind repairs. And, uh, and it's a very effective repair campaign. Over 150 years, this is one of the things that you've got to keep an eye on. The original high factor of safety, and these buildings were built with very high factors of safety. They were built not for deformation, they were really built for progressive collapse because there was multiple stakeholders who wrote the codes. Fire department did not want these buildings falling uh, on their own, um, these unreinforced masonry buildings falling on fire and first responders. So they had a lot of fuses inside the buildings to stop them from progressively collapsing. And then what was, what was sacrificed for that? A high degree of precision with uh, straight floors, wall deformations and stuff. So these buildings do not, do, do not conform the deformation rules that you get in stress strain relationship. What they really are is they're strain based buildings based around high factors of safety. You can have tremendous deformation in this and your stress strain calculations won't work. But the strain calculations and KL over R in a buckled wall does work uh, if you know your thresholds. We'll get into that slow in a minute. Now you've got to watch for a low factor safety in these buildings. Why do you have a low factor safety? because this, the rate of decay is very, very slow in these buildings. And it becomes undetectable because it moves so slowly. So you had a building that was built in 1850 with a very high factor of safety, sometimes more than four. So it would carry more than four times what it was actually designed for, but it's been decaying for almost 200 years. And now what we have is a very small factor of safety where you get some minor uh, event like a fire or collateral damage or underpinning or something like that that causes this catastrophic event at the buildings. The other issue is the buildings are, are you know, they're, they have a relatively low asset value. A four-story tenement building, let's be honest about this, even in the village is not a, a high value building, especially with, with residential units in it. Uh, it's not a high value building. A privately owned one or two family dwelling where you can manipulate it, you don't have a regulated tenant group, that's high value. But a rented dwelling with regulated units is not a high value unit. Why? Because you can't move the tenant group. And the expense of the repairs are high. So you've got a building that's relatively low value, and then you've got this high value repairs. So that's, that's, that's a problem for a lot of landlords. The engineering uh, evaluations are complex, unless they're prescriptive. And that's where it brings in the specialty experience. And you've got small groups of tenants inside these buildings. Most of these buildings have like 12 tenant groups, 12 tenants. It's not like a 20, 30 story, you know, apartment building. You've got four story building with like eight units in it. And, and that's a problem. Okay, here we have uh, wood frame noggin wall buildings. They're all the same. I've given a sketch here of one. Uh, I, this is all original content material. It's not in a design manual. Uh, but I provided a typical noggin wall building. Why? because this is what myself and my colleagues to see every day of the week. There's like 15,000 of these things in the city. And they're very frequent for us because bits fall off them, floors collapse, front walls collapse, and they're always getting messed up from collateral damage. But they all look the same. They got stud walls that are laid out the same way, and they've got brick infill. People mix up the brick thinking it's a bearing wall. It's not, this is a frame building. And collapses are always the same. Decay is always the same, rotten sill plates, uh, decayed foundation wall, um, trauma on the inside of the buildings. The, the layouts are nearly always the same as well. Stairs on one side, chimneys on the other. Doors opposite the stairs, chimneys opposite the stairs. Store, the front doors to the building is always in front of the stairs. So I've given three typical ones here. You will find they're nearly always like this. Wall thickness is four, to five, four by fives, eight inches on center with brick infill, very, very typical. Platform framed, why? Because it was easier to build platform framing for the guys who built these in 1850 and 1860 instead of doing bloom frame, where you needed one piece of lumber that was 30 feet high or 40 feet high. Platform framed, fire escapes, you'll find them on the it's a multiple dwelling law requirement, they're prescriptive. Partitions four by fives, 
all with wood headers and trimmers. Walls have to be plumb straight and true. Okay, good. Next. 19th century tenements, old law tenements, federal row houses, knickerbocker caves, packing crates. I've drawn four out here. They're all the same. And I've given a little matrix of these things. I'm in the process of writing these things up right now. The framing's the same, the performance the same. You'll always have wood header trimmers around the stairs. Floor joists are three by eight, uh, three by tens. Walls have to be plumb straight and true. It's not negotiable. It was in the original code. If the walls are not plumb straight and true, you are in a structural stability issue. Relieving walls around the stairs are critical. Why? Because it's a structural stability fuse. Uh, without the relieving walls around the stairwells, you get tremendous deformation of the floors and you will get progressive collapse in the building if you lose a wall. Converted dwellings, vertical and horizontal enlargements. These things are very tricky because what happens is it's the building started off life as a row house and they're mostly the wall thicknesses are 12 inches. And then what happened is to convert them to a rented dwelling, they popped it up by adding a floor to the roof and then they popped it back about 15 or 20 feet to give a kitchen and a bathroom in the back of the row house. They're all the same, but there's ferocious issues of structural instability in these because when you're messing around inside them, what happens is you reveal the original one or two family dwelling in there. So there's some basic rules in these things, and I've put them there. The partitions are always four by fives, header trimmers. You see a pattern developing for this stuff now. Okay, this is what we've got, buildings at risk. Where are we? Pre-1901 private old lot tenements. There's only 28,000 of them. You can do a prescriptive repair on these things, or it's a piece of cake. You take out what's broken, you put back exactly what's there. Fire escapes are prescriptive, there's a pattern for it. Uh, four story buildings are rarely more than four. Old law tenements are rarely more than four stories. The masonry are wood, and you gotta watch out for stores on the ground floor and corner lot buildings. Why? Because you got a soft story. Stores on the ground floor is a problem because there's no relieving walls. Corner lot buildings, you got a soft story. The issue with a corner lot, you get some instability inside the building, then the whole thing goes down like that building I showed you at the beginning. Downtown Brooklyn and Manhattan, that's primarily where they are. Okay, converted dwellings, 20,000. We're up to 48,000 now. 48,000 of our high you know, buildings you need to pay attention to. They're three-story buildings. These are only three-story, masonry and wood stores on the ground floor. Downtown Brooklyn and Manhattan, very common. Okay, new law tenements is 40,000. Now we're up to nearly 90,000, downtown Brooklyn, Manhattan, Bronx, and some Queens. A little later buildings, they start to develop the Bronx and a little further out in Eastern Queens. Do I know where they are? Yes. Does HPD know where they are? Yes, it's on the record data. Do we know that you can expect problems with these things? Yes. Why is it my opinion? No, I picked it up in the, in the open data. Do we know how to fix them? Yes, they're prescriptive. And this type of thing is not so common. And one or two family private dwellings is about a hundred grand of these things. Uh, they're a little bit more nuanced. You got to check for complaints and stuff. Uh, and legal occupancy is always an issue with, like with those one or two family dwellings. Uh, they're in HPD's database. Uh, they're called NAs. So uh, I'll share that with a little bit with you later on. And there's a sketch of a building that I did. This is prescriptive repairs. Why? There's nothing engineering hard about this stuff. Uh, this is how the buildings were put together, and these are the common things that go wrong with them. Cornices fall off, parapets fall off, fire escapes fall off, portions of floors collapse. Uh, you have walls delaminating from floors. They're all the same, and the repairs are all the same. Complicated? Not really. Okay, so common problems with these issues. Old law tenements, bits falling off. You can be, you can be sure of it. It's a local problem. You can figure it out. Like with like prescriptive repairs, very effective. Where are you to find the problems? Parapets, corners, brownstone falls off these things constantly, terracotta and brick. Uh, but if bits fall off a building, you can usually put them back on the building. So that's kind of one good thing to think, of, uh, think about. It, are bits falling off the building? If bits are falling off it, you can always put them back up. Okay, failing and rotten floors under bathrooms and kitchens. Everybody's had to deal with this issue. We have floors punching through, we have bathrooms punching through, we've got kitchens punching through, 
it's a relatively local problem inside a building and you kind of replace it in kind. Is it difficult to, to do these repairs? No. Uh, is it problematic? Yeah, you may have to move the tenants. Is it complicated engineering? No. Uh, is it effective? Absolutely, you're restoring the original factor of safety. Cistrine war, uh, floor joists, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. If likewise with bits falling off buildings, they've, repaired, they've been repairing these buildings for hundreds of years. No complexity to that. Okay, buckled exterior walls. Buckled exterior walls are a real, real problem. Okay, real problem with buckled exterior walls is you've got a structural stability issue. And this is a decaying uh, structure issue. And it's relatively recent. This has been catching a lot of people out on the hop. They're mixing up bits falling off and floor collapses with serious structural stabilities with buckling walls. And buckling walls, all bets are off. You've got a buckled exterior wall or interior wall in these buildings and you could have a partial or complete collapse inside the building. It's not negotiable and it's a relatively recent occurrence, okay? We get a couple of these things a year and we think it's a singular event. It's not a singular event. It turns up frequently inside these buildings. And then the advantage is now that we know what they are, you have to short embrace them and basically reconstruct the bearing walls. It's, com it's complex, it's expensive, but you can do it. And it takes a long time. And uh, it's a serious structural stability issue. And the numbers are complicated. Running engineering numbers in this issue is a problem. Okay, this is a like with like repair. It's a building I just finished in Chelsea. Bill, a photograph on the left was the original photograph of the, it was actually a, a one family luxury dwelling. It was converted to a multiple dwelling in 1910. And then about 15 years ago, it was vertically and horizontally enlarged. And when the vertical and horizontal enlargement of this converted multiple dwelling from a converted one and two family luxury home messed up the structure and blew out the neighbors. So what we ended up doing is taking everything apart and restoring the building to the original configuration. Easy to do? Yes. Engineering? Not much. Restored the building to the prescriptive requirements? Yes. Did it, was it expensive? It was expensive. It took some time, but it wasn't complicated. Did they have to move the tenants? No, so not too difficult to deal with. Bits falling off. Floors collapsing. Floors collapses around, uh, especially timber frame buildings in the kitchen and bathroom areas. Chimneys collapse inside these buildings rarely regularly. They're not bearing. You can't land a wood joist in a, in a fireplace. It'll ignite the joist. So you find chimneys fall off in these things all the time. Are they easy to repair? They're relatively easy to repair. That's a photograph of a collapsed chimney, which we took recently, and a floor collapse that went with it. And the photograph on the right was a reconstructed building where we had floor collapses, chimney collapses, all the usual mess. And then there was just a replacement in kind, not complicated, not too much engineering. Expensive, yes. Vacates, yes. Uh, took some time, yeah, but the work wasn't difficult. And this is where all belts, bets are off. You get a tilting building or a, or a buckled building or a buckled exterior wall, you cannot underestimate the structural severity of this issue. And it is a relatively recent occurrence. And that is why we are presenting this presentation, because these things are hidden inside the other two, where you have a building with bits falling off and floors collapsing and they're getting missed, where you actually have a real structural stability where the likelihood the entire building is gonna heal over. And those photographs we took less than two months ago. Building on the right is a photograph I took of a converted, um, it was a converted two family, multiple dwelling. There was some renovation work, but it had pulled away from the neighbor 14 inches. And it was a wood frame building. When you see the siding, it's nearly a wood frame Nagamal building. Precipitously close to collapse. Easy to fix, very difficult. Dangerous to shore, absolutely. Were they able to keep this building? <coughs> the owner elected to keep it because they had some difficult zoning issues to get over. So they shored this building, they're gonna reconstruct it in kind. Photograph on the left, where we lost the front facade of a wood frame building, very common occurrence, but that building happened to be vacant. But that was a public safety issue, where the whole thing landed on the street, destroyed, the street ended up on top of cars, nobody got hurt. There was no sidewalk shed on this thing, so who was watching it? Somebody was absolutely watching it because there was a planned demo in there. <coughs> 
immediate drawing, yes. Vacates, yes. Enforcement action, yeah. Stop work order, yes. The development is gone now because nobody's going to finance this development. There was actually two parts in this because of the collapse. There was a big insurance claim. Then we had enforcement, all that types of nonsense that went with this. Buckled uh, walls, not too difficult to fix. You shore them, you take them out, and you rebuild them. You've got uh, failed floors, prescriptive. Replace them. That's a photograph of the building I did in Carroll Gardens, where we lost a bearing wall. We lost the bearing wall, but we were able to shore the rest of the floor. Why? Because the floors got hung up on the relieving wall around the stairs. It was the third bearing wall. Rebuild the walls. Absolutely. Vacate the apartments for sure. Collateral damage, not so much collateral damage here. And th this is the problem with this thing. The landlord had to put millions into replacing all of this worn out and buckled wall. And what do you end up with? You end up with basically the same building. It's quite unjust, but you, that's what ends up happening. You end up rebuilding basically what you start off with. Is there improvements? Not really. Did you get more apartments? No. Uh, did you have to relocate all the tenants? Yes, this landlord actually had tenant groups that he could send uh, the tenants to, but it was a big mess and it required us to shut down streets and it was a lot of uh, disruption and it was expensive. And I kind of felt for the landlord, they didn't really do anything wrong here, but the building is just a prescriptive, multiple dwelling, old lot tenement, buckled exterior wall due to the way it's constructed. Uh, and that's just goes part. Could he take it down and rebuild it? Is stuck with the way the regulated units were in this building. And it was a state law requiring reconstruction in kind due to the regulated units. So that's what the landlord elected to do, replace it in kind. They got some insurance claim. It took about a year to collect that on that. There was lots of fighting over the insurance money, but this guy put millions into this building to rebuild basically what they had to start with. But what did we do correctly on this? We saved the building, which was nice. And we didn't cause any collapses on the street, which was a good thing. And the landlord ended up getting that. Questions? Okay, this is another thing I want to show everybody. Um, okay, this is the open data references that we have. We have a lot of presentations that we presented that I have presented on pieces of this issue where we've been trying to stick a harpoon in this whale for decades. And we kind of got one in there now. We're trying to put a pin in this balloon to try and get a hold of what, why all of these buildings are causing such trouble with engineers. Now we kind of know what we've got our hands on. We kind of got 100,000 buildings, still a big population, but we kind of know what to expect, where they are, how to fix them, and how to restructure them. And that is big because it goes with a regulated tenant group that you can find. Okay, so we like that. And, and that information is available to all of you that are attending this presentation. Okay, what have we got? David uh, Grinder at 245. The Court Street collapse shows complaints to DOB about failing structural wall, go back years, and multiple inspections by the DOB, which resulted in no actions. Uh, how can it be said that it failed without warning? Right, an owner is, obli is, is obliged to maintain these buildings safe. We are regulators. <clears throat> and this is a good point, uh, Mr. Grinder. It's true. If you actually look at the failure to maintain and the complaints, there is a history on these buildings. We interact with owners on a regular basis, but there is a million point one million buildings in New York City. Owners have an obligation to maintain them safe. There are, I can't, speak specifically as to as to Court Street, okay, because it's under investigation, but we're just talking about in the general, in the abstract. Problem is that many times we have builders and engineers and contractors look at these buildings and they don't understand that there's patterns and there's a relatively simple procedure for assessing the risk for these buildings. Owners don't know, or else owners have been are being misinformed. Some owners turned around to us and say, I hired an engineer and I hired a contractor. Nobody told me that the building was as dangerous as it was. Um, so that's one of the issue. Do we need, do, does the building uh, department give out violations? We give out the violations liberally and we don't want to be doing that. We'd rather owners spend the money fixing, fixing their own buildings. It's a good point. There is failure to maintain issued on these buildings. 
uh, but it is a hardship for owners to have to pay some of these fines. I'd rather than fix the buildings. So it's an education, it's an outreach for landlords, engineers to make sure that we recognize these risky buildings on the lot line. Good question. If a building has certain portions that are not code compliant, even to the governing codes at the time of construction, does the owner need to bring it up to the codes or just the original code? If the building was never code compliant, even when it would start, it's difficult to reconstruct it in kind. I have found that we have had 12 inch bearing wall buildings that were built as eight inches. We found a few in Brooklyn. And we, the, the interesting thing is when we took the building apart, the landlord rebuilt them in, in accordance with, with whatever code we, it doesn't really matter <clears throat> what code you're rebuilding them to. If you have a non-code compliant building that requires reconstruction, you're gonna fit the best. It'll be the best fit. It's rare that we have historic buildings from the 19th century that weren't code compliant. It's just rare. I very rarely see them where a building should have been 12 inch bearing wall and was nine, eight inches. I don't see them that often. When we do come across them, that it's a structural stability issue. What I usually tell is the landlord, look, you're gonna take the wall down anyway. Rebuild it as a 12 inch wall. And generally they have no objection to that. It doesn't cost them twice as much to rebuild a 12 inch wall as an eight inch wall. Uh, but that's a good question. Let me see, what are the questions? Um, is there a project in the work for structural safety review similar to local law 11? We have an existing building code committee underway right now. If you were doing local law 11, which is compliance inspections for structural stability and appurtenances, it's cumbersome to do it for buildings under six stories. Why? Every building in New York City is basically under six stories. There's only, out of 1.1 million buildings, there's only 11, uh, 14,500 that are over six stories. 14,000, the number's inconsequential. The building's over six stories. That means every building in New York City has to be in some type of compliance inspection. We already have it. The housing maintenance code, of which I gave, which is there, the housing maintenance code requires them to maintain the building safe. The multiple dwelling law requires them to maintain the building safe. The, every building code since 1880, since 1860, since 1850, require landlords to maintain their buildings safe. What they have to do is figure out what the building was built for. Buckled walls, deal breakers. Collapsing floors, not that difficult to fix. What you have to do is determine whether you have a precipitously risky building. You don't wait for the building to fall down. Not that difficult to figure out. Okay. Uh, it's going to be hard for a local law 11 type universe for existing buildings. Why? It's 100,000 buildings at an absolute minimum. Could be a million buildings at an absolute maximum. Is it likely that we're going to end up getting more compliance? Yeah, I'm not too sure. It does help that we get the education out to say, let's start with this 100,000 buildings that are highly populated with tenant groups. Uh, that are on the older side, we get that for nothing. Uh, there's 100,000 of them. We know where they are, and it's on open data, which means that you are not getting some, you know, somebody to evaluate these things based on, you know, uh, rules of thumb or institutional knowledge, all of that rubbish, okay? During pre-construction inspectors, the neighbors will not let us in to evaluate the existing conditions. What can we do? Well, the building department does help a lot with that. We can't take on being an advocate for the developer getting in next door. But generally, if neighbors are represented by an engineer, the engineer, it's in everybody's interest to maintain the building safe. Generally, landlords, if they, if they who are working next door to collateral uh, to a development, generally, you can get an access agreement. And why it's private property? You got to remember that it's private property. But there's a kicker those landlords are required to maintain their buildings safe. So it's a double-edged sword. So um, usually what it turns out is the tenant groups have trouble letting the developers in, but the landlords are usually okay about letting developers in. So uh, just remember that you gotta, uh, you know, there's a privacy issue with tenants and landlords generally are compliant. I rarely come across a landlord doesn't allow access. We'll allow access for, uh, for observations in the code. Um, sometimes you may have, the developer may have to pay for temporary protection like sheds and stuff like that. Why? It's private property. 
okay? And he's not, uh, the, the, the landlord of the adjacent building is not a, an equity partner for the developer. It doesn't mean that he's going to get anything from the development next door, other than three years of grief, collateral damage, stuff falling off, block street exits, construction workers in and out all along the sidewalk, uh, blocked uh, vehicular access. So, you know, so you've got to take that into consideration as well. Okay. Um, anything else? Any other questions? Everybody, well, uh, I've left my email. You can send me an email if you have a question on this. I will post this. If this is original content material, it's not a boilerplate and it is based on open data. So please remember that all of this information is in the public domain and I will gladly share it with everybody. And uh, we will, we, I'm, at Sioni, we're doing a lot of presentations with Sioni, a lot of presentations with AIA. It's been accurate. These observations that we've been done inside this presentation turned out to be predictive and accurate. And uh, and we'll deal with the calculations separately. Uh, I think that is it. Uh, recordings will be recordings will be uh, available. How often would you recommend an assessment of these smaller buildings? That's a good question. Uh, recommendations for assessment of smaller buildings every so often. Like, uh, if you can get a landlord to let you in once every couple of seasons is more than adequate. What question hasn't been done? Okay, I have a question. If a building on a, uh, on a close to zero lot line property, nine inches next to a commercial building, and have precast panels which have been installed higher than the adjacent roof, will it be required to vacate next door? Generally, you can have the upper two floors vacated, but it depends on what type of, of, um, of protection is, provi is being provided by the developer. That is really that question about uh, the panels over an adjacent building. It's, that's really a site safety issue as opposed to a vacancy issue. No, well, I've been told many times when you have a critical pick over an adjacent building um, that sometimes they, they temporarily vacate the top two floors of a wood frame building. Uh, or put a crash deck in. So that's also viable. That's the chapter 33 issue. Okay, uh, if a building has certain portions that are not code compliant, uh, even to the governing codes at the time of construction, does the owner need to bring it up to current codes or just the original code? All buildings, it's in the administrative code that buildings are allowed to stay uh, as they were built per the original construction codes. It's, it's disingenuous to try and make a four story. 1850s old law tenement building compliant to a 2008 or 2014 building code. One thing that's not negotiable is uh, egress, fire and egress, but you can solve those without having to restructure a building. So basically, if you follow the original specifications for the building, all walls have to be plumb straight and true. That was a code requirement. Uh, relieving walls from the cellar to the roof, code requirement. All of these things are kitted parts, high factor safety, prescriptive law, wonderful. Why? Because once you get that, you get the spec for the building. It's a great idea. You would have a hard time making these 19th century unreinforced masonry and wood frame buildings compliant to today's code. Also, the engineering calculations best on stress strain relationships are non compatible with a building that doesn't comply to deformation. What was the other question? How often do you recommend? I did that one. Uh, is there a fairly project called, uh, did that? Uh, okay, what's the question? No others. What if an architect sees next door, they make post? Okay, here. Uh, if an architect sees, okay, here's a good question from Mr. Malik. What if an architect, we see the next door building may pose a structural stability on our building, especially when neighbor's owner is not paying attention to our notices? Call it in. 311 is designed for you to call in the neighbor. You keep putting complaints on that building, we'll eventually round up with the landlord. If the landlord is not maintaining the building next door, we'll get there eventually. Remember, we deal with 1.1 million buildings and we're complaint driven. We're not your design consultants. We're not an advocacy group. We are a regulator. Eventually, we'll catch up with the neighbor. Once we get there, we will make sure the neighbor maintains their building. There could be strategy for the neighbor not maintaining the building. Vacate the tenants, let the building go to bits. 
uh, let the roof leak, get the tenant groups out. Well, all of that stuff is gone. We're dealing with that now with our tenant protection plans and our uh, tenant advocacy groups. You know, we're in a better place than we were five years ago. We'll help with that issue. Okay, community boards were to be stabilized and building for possible effects the next door. We know by BAB. Uh, I just answered that. Uh, New York City community boards are currently providing their comments on the fiscal year 2000 budget. Are there any specific requests the CB can uh, advocate uh, for related to the regulation buildings that were highlighted under HPD jurisdiction? Uh, all landlords are to maintain the building safe and they got to get an assessment if they have another assessment on the existing building and there's a history of complaints. They need it to be done. Uh, will there be requirements for owners to hire engineers to perform existing conditions? Not at the moment. Okay, Master, on a regular basis. No, not at the moment. It's too heavy a lift for us. Um, what am I required to see? Structural issues in the Jason building. I did that one. What is your email? I'll put my email up. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. What is your email? Tim Lynch, T I M L Y N C H, at buildings.nyc.gov. Remember, this is original content. It's a work in progress. There's more to come, but this thing is founded in facts, and you can go to the bank with the presentation today. The information is stable. Uh, oh, are there code changes in the works for abatement permits to be allowed if demos is not going to happen immediately after? Good question. We have to watch demolition projects where the roof gets stripped of the membrane because what happens is the structural stability of the building gets impaired. What we're doing is we've actually phoned the large demolition uh, filers. There's three or four of them. We've actually outreached to them and told them to give us a list of buildings that they think the roof membranes have been stripped where the building has not been demolished. We would have trouble with that. Why? Because asbestos abatement is not our regulation. It's a DEP requirement. And we, we, we don't have a database, uh, an open data database that's tracking this data. Good question. Okay. In the works for abatement permits to be allowed if demo is not going. That's an excellent question. Uh, is your, your email address, okay. Okay, wait, hold on a moment. There was one more question there about IMB. Site safety plans, which are not required to be approved by the, why can they be scanned into virtual lab neighbors that are influencing the work? Yeah, anybody can file a set of site safety plans. There's a question from Yuri. Yuri, you can, if the site safety plan has been approved, you can file it. You can ask for the drawings to be sent to you. Uh, site safety plans, they're not in the public domain. Why? Because they're temporary. They only get, they're like a crane set of drawings. They're only for the life cycle of the construction of the permit. They don't live with the building. They just live with the chapter 33 work. So we don't generally file them and record them. They are of a very temporary nature. Okay, now there's nothing to do. Uh, okay, good. The IMD buildings, intermodal multiple dwelling buildings don't get classified as HBD despite being residentially. Is there an intention to include them in future? Data counts. IMD buildings are odd. Uh, they're odd. They're really not multiple dwellings. They're non compliant tenement dwellings. There are very few of them. Uh, but there is a regulatory unit that deals with them. It's called the Loft Board. Um, are they likely to be rolled into the multiple dwelling universe? Likely when the building ends up with a CFO. But at the moment, in this interim position where we're converting lofts, to multiple dwellings and they're neither a lot nor a multiple dwelling. We have a special regulatory unit. It's been around for 30 years for these hybridized loft buildings. Don't think there's a lot of these. There's a couple of thousand of them left in the city. And over a period of time, they do these IMD interval multiple dwellings, which are buildings that are transitional between being a loft building and being a multiple dwelling. And they're transitional. They end up, will end up with a CFO and they will be a multiple dwelling eventually. Uh, existing building code coming soon. Uh, yes, uh, we're working on it currently, and uh, we're working on it currently, and we've got many fine vendors and consultants that are helping us with this. It's difficult to put together, frankly, and the type of information that you got today is 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 a, is a preview of issues that we are finding 
because we are beginning to understand the existing building universe. It's not about material science. It's about classification of buildings and can you subdivide these large packages of, of unreinforced masonry buildings into manageable groups. If they're manageable groups, are you inside the manageable group? Uh, anything else? No. Okay, that's it. I'm going to sign off. Thank you for attending. Uh, send me an email if you didn't understand anything in the presentation. The sketches I'll provide liberally, they deal with a lot of the common problems and the rules that are associated with them. They're all prescriptive. I didn't make them up. And anybody has a question regarding any of these housing stocks, send me send me a question and I'll send you the references and the C of, and the um, and the references. Uh, thank you. That's it.